This presentation will cover the X-ray imaging of the thorax. Here is an image of the normal anatomy of the breast. Here is a medial lateral X-ray on which we can see the pectoralis major muscle, the Cooper's ligaments, also known as the suspensory ligaments of the breast, which are connective tissue septa extending from our clavi pectoral fascia towards the skin. This tissue is fat. This is more radiolucent than the surrounding tissues and therefore appears darker. Here is the nipple. This is receiving our lectiferous ducts, which are in this region, which are draining the lobules of the mammary gland, which would occupy this bit space. This is a mammogram. This is a type of low-dose x-ray used for specifically imaging the breast. The thymus is a lymphatic structure in the anterior and superior mediastinum, as you can see here on lateral x-ray. Here we have outlined it so that you may see the two lobes of this organ. The inferior borders of these lobes may be visible as the so-called sail sign. The thymus functions in T-cell maturation and is most active in the neonatal and pre-adolescent periods. As sex hormone levels increase in the prepubertal period, it begins to atrophy and becomes replaced by fat, so that in the adult, the thymus is a much smaller structure, as you can see here, and this is rarely visible on x-ray. Analysis of chest x-rays is best done in a systematic manner. We will examine the thorax anatomy by using the alphabet technique of x-ray analysis. The first step of this analysis is to look at the quality of the x-ray. What position has the x-ray been taken from? Have the rays entered the patient from posterior to anterior, from anterior to posterior, or from a lateral aspect? When we consider the first two views, the most commonly used is the so-called PA film, posterior anterior. This is because in a posterior anterior x-ray, rays will enter the body from posterior and due to ray divergence, the structures the rays encounter first will appear larger and less defined than the structures in the anterior of the body. Since examination of the heart, which is occupying the anterior of the body, is so important, we will need this area to be clear and therefore the PA film is the more commonly used of the two. The AP film is used in cases where it would be difficult for the patient to stand upright as it can be taken with the patient in a decubitus position. We also examine if the patient has taken an adequately deep inspiration. If this is the case, the posterior aspects of the 10th ribs and the anterior aspects of the 5th or 6th ribs should be visible above the diaphragm. If the correct exposure was used, the vertebrae should be visible just behind the heart. And to assess rotation of the patient, we observe the medial ends of the clavicles, which should be equidistant from the midline of the patient. Next, we will examine bones and soft tissue. The first rib, which we can see here, is short, atypical and broad. The superior seven ribs are the true or vertebral sternal ribs, which attach to the sternum via their own costal cartilage. The eighth, through 10th ribs are the false or vertebral chondral ribs which attach to the costal cartilage of the rib above. The remaining two ribs are the floating ribs. The scapulae are usually very protracted due to the positioning of the patient during imaging. This is so that they do not obscure the lung fields. We can see the coracoid processes of the scapulae here and here. We can see the head of the humerus occupying the glenoid cavity sitting beside the glenoid cavity here. The clavicles are generally visible in their entirety. We see the medial sternal end of the clavicle articulating with the sternum here at the sternoclavicular joint and the acromial end articulating with the scapula at the acromioclavicular joint here. We can imagine the conoid and trapezoid ligaments which would attach here running to the coracoid process. The vertebrae are visible in the midline. We can especially see the spinous processes of the vertebrae here along the midline. The sternum is often obscured by other midline structures and is not visible here. Soft tissues such as the breast, nipples, skin folds and sometimes adipose tissue between muscular layers are also visible. The next structure we will examine is the heart. The heart should occupy less than 50% of the thoracic diameter i.e. the cardiothoracic ratio should be less than 0.5.
Here we see the superior vena cava joining our right atrium here. Here we can see our right ventricle, which is culminating on the infundibulum, which becomes our pulmonary trunk, dividing into left and right pulmonary arteries. Here we can see the left ventricle culminating on our aorta. Here's our ascending aorta, arch of aorta, and descending thoracic aorta. Here we see the oracle of the left atrium. These images show the positions, approximate positions, of the heart valves on frontal and lateral x-rays. Now we will examine the diaphragm. The right hemidiaphragm, here, is higher due to the position of the liver. Under the left hemidiaphragm, we can sometimes see the gastric air bubble, here, through which lung tissue can be seen. This lower air bubble, which we can see here, is gas in our intestine. Fusions can sometimes cause blunting of the costophrenic angles, which are here. These angles are formed between the diaphragm and the lateral thoracic wall. Here they are on lateral x-ray. The cardiophrenic angles here can also be seen between the diaphragm and heart, but these are usually smooth and not sharp. The lung fields on the right contain the upper, middle and lower lobes. The lung field on the left contains just upper and lower lobes. The lung fissures mark the lines of visceral pleura between these lobes. They are usually not prominent unless an effusion is present. The oblique, also known as major lung fissure, are also usually not visible on frontal x-rays as they run more parallel to the x-ray beam. These are usually visible on lateral x-rays here. The minor or horizontal fissure, which is only present on the right, is visible approximately 40% of the time on frontal x-rays. It is found running from the lateral edge of the lung towards the hilum. The interface of the right and left pleural layers medially will form the junction lines. These can be seen here anteriorly, where they meet just behind the sternum and here posteriorly, where they meet posterior to the esophagus and anterior to the T3 to 5 vertebrae. The great vessels can be seen emanating from the heart. Here we see the brachiocephalic trunk. Here, the left subclavian artery. Here again we see our ascending aorta, arch of aorta and descending thoracic aorta. Here we can see the pulmonary arteries, left and right. A useful way to identify these is to find the aortopulmonary window. This is a concavity in the left mediastinal border between aorta and left pulmonary artery. The aortic knob or knuckle here is the left lateral border of the aorta as it arches posteriorly and inferiorly. Here is our superior vena cava. This projection that we see on its lateral wall is the point at which the azygous vein is joining this vessel. The hyla will contain the pulmonary arteries, which we can see here and here, and on this side here and here. They will also contain the pulmonary veins, as well as the primary bronchi, which we can see on this image here and here. The hyla will also contain some lymph nodes, which are generally not observed on x-ray unless they are abnormal. We can see again the trachea here, and the point at which it divides into our two main bronchi, which is here, the carina. The paratra paratracheal stripes, which are either side of the trachea, are found between the air in the trachea and the air in the lungs. The right stripe is normally very thin whereas the left is generally more obscured due to other mediastinal structures. The azygoesophageal stripe indicates the interface of the right lung and the parietal pleura which is overlying the azygous vein and the esophagus. The paraspinal stripes indicate the lateral borders of the spinal column. The trachea will branch into the main bronchi, which will then further branch into three lobar bronchi on the right and two lobar bronchi on the left, these will then subsequently branch into segmental bronchi, 
Each segment in bronchi will supply a bronchopulmonary segment. This image shows the branch branching pattern of our bronchopulmonary segments. The final step in examining a chest x-ray is to take in your overall impression of the image. Thank you for listening.